So we are now going to get into talking about creep, fracture, and fatigue. Um, creep is a very insidious mechanism. Um, so we've talked about plastic deformation um, and dislocation glide, but one of the most insidious forms of uh, basically, you know, destructive you know, mechanisms or fracture can occur via creep or plastic deformation. And the problem is that creep can occur at stresses much, much less than the yield stress when we have elevated temperatures, specifically greater than 0.3, the melting temperature for metals and for ceramics, 0.5 times half the melting temperature. So creep is time uh, or temperature dependent plastic deformation in crystalline materials. Uh, and it again, it can occur at stresses much less than the yield stress that's reported. Uh, so that is the kind of insidious mechanism. You've designed your material, you think that you're safe, you've done all the yielding mechanisms, uh, Tresca ranking, but you still can observe uh, plastic deformation. So there are three regimes of creep. Primary or transient creep, which we typically don't have to worry about. Secondary or steady state creep, where we can actually predict essentially how the material will behave. And when, once you hit tertiary or runaway creep, the game is over, the material is going to fail, um, and you're in a bad situation. So you can't stop it at that point. What we as engineers need to do is figure out how can we predict um, basically the extent of secondary creep or constant uh, creep rates. Uh, so that's where we're going to kind of um, stay at. So we're going to, uh, again, we need to make sure, again, that the total creep um, strain is less than the allowable for the particular application. Um, the time must be less than the failure. These are kind of um, somewhat obvious things, but uh, we want to make sure that um, this will be okay. Um, so we can actually look at uh, how creep or mechanisms of creep diffusion can occur. So if we don't apply any stress, B or atoms A and C can hop equally probable into um, B. Um, so they can equally probably jump in there. When I apply this stress though, we can see that atom A is going to have a much, much, much more likely it moves into B than C because we're going with essentially or along that applied um, that applied stress. So we're moving with in, as opposed to against it. So it's much, much more probable that A will jump and in, hop into B as opposed to C. C will effectively never pop into um, B because of that applied stress. Um, so there are different optimistic mechanisms of creep. So we just looked at um, kind of stress enhanced or uh, stress uh, stress enhanced diffusion. Um, we're going to also look at, there's multiple diffusive pathways. So we're going to talk about diffusion or uh, or basically the extension of material in the bulk. We're going to look at diffusion along grain boundaries and the activation energy for diffusion is always lower in the grain boundary than in the bulk because there's more room in the grain boundary. Um, so when we look at creep mechanisms, there are going to be many creep mechanisms that move and atoms basically extend via bulk diffusion. So the motion, basically vacancy diffusion. So atoms either move into vacancies or vacancies move. Grain boundary diffusion will also dominate certain creep mechanisms as well. Um, now, the question you may ask is, well, if diffusion is always higher in the grain boundary, why doesn't we just always diffuse it along the grain boundary? Well, there's limited grain boundaries in our material. Um, so typically your grain boundary width is gonna be at least two atomic diameters around five angstroms. Um, so, uh, you're limited in terms of that space, uh, in terms of that spacing there. So that grain boundary width is typically constant, um, but if we look at the ratio of the areas of our grains, of the bulk grain, so if we approximate that as a you know cylindrical grain you know area versus the area of the grain boundary, you can see that ratio here tells us something very very important below. So while the width of that grain boundary is constant your DG can change from uh, basically tens of nanometers to hundreds of micrometers, maybe even millimeters. So you're gonna get a huge change uh, in that ratio there. Um, so that that's, that's a large value. So as we shrink the grain size, obviously the ratio gets larger and there's more diffusive pathways to move along grain boundaries. When the grain size is large, there are very few diffusive pathways um, for your grain boundary diffusion. So, Let's look at um, some different mechanisms of, and types of creep. So power law creep um, is gonna move via climb. So it is thermally assisted still, um, but um, it will be assisted, uh, in addition to thermal assistance, it will be dominated a lot by 
essentially the, the mechanical response. So the material will climb up and the vacancies will move up your um, basic dislocation to remove uh, planes of atoms. In the second stage of creep, we can write a general relationship for a constant uh, creep rate. And it's gonna be a function of stress, grain size, and what type of diffusion is gonna occur here. Uh, and we specifically wanna look at the scaling. So we can have Navarro herring creep, which is called bulk diffusion. Um, so you see that it is scales as stress to the first power, dg to the uh, minus two, and then it's bulk diffusion. Cobalt creep, the difference there is grain boundary diffusion, and it scales as dg to the minus three. Still similarly to the one power with respect to um, stress. Cobalt creep will dominate at very, very small grain sizes, as you can see in that equation. And power law creep scales as stress to the four to the sixth power, heavily dependent there. It is bulk diffusion dominated, and there is no scaling with regards to grain size. So power law creep should dominate at high stresses. Cobalt creep will dominate at very, very small grain sizes, and your Navarro herring or your volume diffusion will dominate um, basically at high stress values, uh, or high temperature values, excuse me, and lower stress values. We'll also have dislocation glide. Again, those are the mechanisms, PK forces that we've already calculated, so though those really don't operate at temperature. That line is your yield strength of your material. Um, you also have your theoretical yield strength. That's the dotted line. Again, that's gonna be your calculation of G over 10, and an elastic regime as well. Um, so the dislocation glide mechanisms are independent of temperature effectively. They, they change slightly as you can see on that curve. There are lots of ways to kind of mitigate the creep. A lot of them are basically creating precipitate particles or anaphase boundaries, um, but those are the mechanisms. And next time we're gonna get into fracture. So we'll see you then.